Viola here today. Um, Damiano did his PhD uh, in Pisa in Italy, after which he moved to uh, Florence to work uh, with uh, Professor Fassi, is that it? Correct. In, uh, for two, two years in total, uh, after which he moved to Princeton uh, as a uh, postdoctoral fellow in 2011 to work with uh, Anatoly Spitskovsky. Uh, and it's been there, there ever since, and that's where we first met. And, uh, and Damiano, is, uh, his main interest is, is, uh, is uh, cosmic rays, at least for the last few years. And he's been working on several papers with uh, Anatoly. And I think that we'll, uh, his talk today will be about a summary of, of all those papers. Yep. Go ahead. Thank you, Dan. Thank you for, for the invitation and for having me on such a short notice. And uh, I'm really enjoying both the city and especially the, the, the institute. So today I will. Um, I will talk about uh, some new results about uh, the origin of cosmic rays in general of accelerated particles. And uh, you know, the history of cosmic rays uh, usually dates back to 1912, when Victor Hess discovered that uh, the, there, is an ex there must be an extraterrestrial source of radiation, because the level of uh, uh, the, the rate of ionization goes up when you fly over a balloon, and you are getting uh, away from the radioactive elements in the crust. And uh, so the uh, level of uh, ionization rate goes down, and then eventually above 600 meters above the sea level, it goes up again. That means that there is something coming from uh, outside Earth that is uh, ionizing. And uh, uh, many people know about Hess, but less people know about Auguste Picard, who in the 30s was the first man to reach the stratosphere on, uh, with just a pressurized aluminum gondola. And uh, he, is, he is with uh, his assistant, they have these rudimental helmets, just a basket with a pillow. Because you can imagine that, that how uh, tough it is to, to fly like 16 kilometers and uh, just to measure cosmic ray fluxes. And uh, in the 40s, uh, Bruno Rossi and Pierre Roger were, were the first to discover that these uh, energetic particles up to 10 to the 5 and that to the GeV produce extended showers when they interact with atoms in the atmosphere. And uh, that was the origin, uh, I mean, the uh, beginning of the cosmic ray measurement at very high energies. Nowadays, we know that the flux of cosmic rays at Earth spans over almost 12 orders of magnitude from sub GeV to 10 to the 20 EV, uh, which just with just the power law in energy that uh, has some uh, features, the usual, the, it's e to minus 2.7, there are the so-called knee, where the spectrum gets slightly uh, steeper, and then there is an, another flattening about 10 to the 18, a few times 10 to the 18, which is called the ankle, usually. And the natural question is, what is able to produce such a beautiful power law over so many orders of magnitude? So a uh, rule of thumb criterion for understanding what sources are in principle able to accelerate particles up to a given energy is the so-called HILAS criterion, in which you plot the size of your accelerator and uh, the typical magnetic field. And just by requiring that uh, the Larmor radius of uh, the particle uh, is encompassed by the source, you get this uh, constraint on size and magnetic field. And uh, you see that uh, above, uh, uh, so galactic, con uh, above 10 to the 17 electron volt, you cannot, you don't have sources in, uh, in our galaxy because the Larmor radius of the particles at 10 to the 17 is larger than the size of the galaxy in the typical interstellar field. And so Above 10 to the 17, cosmic rays must be of extragalactic origin. And uh, today, I will only focus on galactic cosmic rays, say, up to the knee and uh, uh, slightly above. But in principle, uh, there is interesting physics also in this. I, I'd be happy to chat with people if they are interested about the possible origin of these ultra range cosmic rays. So the main argument why so uh, the main source of uh, galactic cosmic rays uh, is thought to be supernova remnants. And there are basically three reasons for this. The first one is the energetics. That was already bad, and Zwicky pointed out in the 30s. If you take the typical energy density of cosmic rays in our galaxy, 
and you of course model our galaxies as cylinder with a given with usual radius and height, you see that the, the total power in uh, the total energy in our galaxies, this one, if you take the typical confinement time of cosmic rays in our galaxy, you get the typical luminosity in cosmic rays in our galaxy. And uh, if you compare this with the typical uh, power, the typical luminosity in supernovae, like the rate of supernovae times the kinetic energy, 10 to the, the famous 10 to the 51 ergs released per explosion, you have a, a comparable uh, luminosity. That means that if you can channel 10 to 20% of the supernova kinetic energy into cosmic rays, you can replenish the uh, uh, steady flux of cosmic rays that we observe. But uh, there is uh, another uh, huge argument about, uh, for in favor of supernova remnants, and namely uh, is the acceleration mechanism. So Fermi already pointed out that if you have uh, a random scattering against the walls or magnetic mirrors that are moving that are moving with random velocities with respect to you on average you, you gain energy the reason is very simple if you throw a particle against the wall and if, if you have an elastic scattering particles come back with the same energy but if the wall is approaching towards you the particle can, comes back with more energy if the wall is receding it comes back with less energy but since statistically head-on collisions are, most, are more probable than bumps or tail collisions, on average the particle gains energy. However, in, in, the, in the late 70s, people realized, different people uh, realized almost simultaneously that there is an astrophysical uh, configuration, namely a shock, in which all the collisions are head-on collisions. So if you, if, you get a, if you have a particle diffusing on both sides of the shock, uh, you, you, can, you can easily see that from the hydrodynamics of the shock. If a particle is, is in the upstream, it sees the downstream, so in the unshocked medium, it sees the downstream fluid coming towards it. So if it crosses the shock, it will undergo a head-on collision. But the same is true also if the particle sits in the downstream, so in the post-shock fluid, which we'll see the upstream fluid coming towards it. So if a particle diffuses around the shock, it, it is as if it were squeezed between two converging flows. And every time it crosses the shock, it gains a little bit of energy. The nice thing of this diffusive shock acceleration is that uh, there is, this process naturally produces power law and momentum and this, this slope only depends uh, on the hydrodynamics of the shock. So for strong shocks, uh, namely with Mach number much larger than one, the compression ratio, so the density of the downstream hot plasma with respect to the upstream cold plasma, is 10 to 4. And uh, therefore, the uh, slope in momentum space tends to 4. So at strong shocks, you naturally have P2 minus 4 distribution. And this having a, such a universal slope, it's a good starting point for explaining this, the power law slope in uh, uh, cosmic ray fluxes. There is a third uh, argument in favor of, of uh, supernova remnants, and namely if you take an X-ray map of young remnants, you see these narrow non-thermal uh, X-ray rims, which are due to synchrotron loss losses of very energetic electrons. And uh, in order for electrons to radiate their energy away on such a small scale, like a, f a percent of a parsec or so, you need the magnetic field to be very large. So the magnetic field is, the lower limit on the magnetic field is a few hundred microgauss. That's a factor of 100 larger than the typical uh, magnetic field in the interstellar medium. So the, clearly in these, uh, and you get the same, uh, the, the same uh, estimate if you try to fit this, the synchrotron emission from radio to X-rays, the average downstream magnetic field may be, must be as large as 200 microgauss in this remnant. So this means that uh, there is some magnetic field generation going on at the shock. And if you remember the HILAS criterion, having a large magnetic field helps accelerating particles at a larger and larger energy. So it favors particle diffusion 
and uh, this is a key ingredient. So this could be the, the conclusions, apparently, of my talk. Simply, supernova remnants have the right energetics. You have generally power laws and uh, the magnetic field amplification help uh, reaching the knee. But unfortunately, there is but, or also spinning wheel. Sorry, <laughs> I don't know why. Oh, sometimes this slide. OK, but the key questions are, uh, is indeed acceleration and shocks efficient? And also, uh, how this magnetic field amplification occurs? Uh, is it driven by the same cosmic rays that are being accelerated? And then again, what are the conditions for having efficient cosmic ray acceleration? What is the geometry and of the shock? What are the strength of the shock that favor uh, acceleration of ions and electrons? Eventually, what determines the fraction of particles that end up being injected in cosmic ray? So in order to do this, we can uh, study the basics of shocks. And astrophysical shocks are typically collisionless. So they are mediated by collective electromagnetic process, uh, processes and not particle-particle uh, uh, collisions. But they are also sources of most of the non-thermal particles and emission in the universe. Several examples of these are the Earth well, shock, uh, coronal uh, interplanetary shocks triggered by coronal mass ejections, uh, stellar bow shocks, uh, supernova remnants, uh, AGN lobes, uh, megaparsec-wide sausages in uh, clusters of galaxies. And there are also some relativistic counterparts like uh, pulsar wind nebulae, gamma ray bursts, AGN jets. And then there are objects like these. It's an one end clusters, where is that actually from? Uh, so this is uh, from the paper. Wh which paper? Or well, well, so just, this is a radio very relic. Very long, very coherent. And this the is, is that an accurate description, or is it smooth, false color? No, actually, this is uh, an, an amazingly uh, regular structure. Of our, uh, so this is a radio, so-called radio. Um, so th this shock is seen in the radio, and uh, it's two megaparsec wide. And the polarization is so regular that it really uh, requires a coherent uh, uh, a picture for describing the, these, uh, um, these shocks. So you can study also the gradient in, uh, uh, in the spectrum of particles when you go in the downstream. There are a few objects like this. This is called the sausage. Uh, there is the toothbrush relic, and uh, they have fancy names. But is there a sense of how strong the structure is? It's hard to tell. The polarization is quite high, so it claims like 60%. So it claims for it requires a rather uh, ordered field, or at least the regions that shine seem to have a given ordered field. Uh, this is the typical high beta plasmas, typical of a galaxy cluster. So uh, the sonic, the shock velocity is uh, 1,000 kilometers per second, 10 to the 8 uh, uh, Kelvin temperature, and micro Gauss field as a rule of thumb. And uh, anybody knows what this uh, object is? Probably not, because this is not an astrophysical object. This is a, a laboratory experiment uh, in which there are several groups uh, in, um, in different uh, uh, laser laboratories that are trying to reproduce uh, collisional shocks, uh, or at least astrophysical conditions, in laboratory by shooting. But when did that occur? I mean, this was a long-standing thing that we used to always say can't make them in the lab. So, when did, when did uh, so this is not properly a shock yet, but this is the onset of that. It's something. So the set. So this is an experiment that uh, is led by. Uh, so PI is Anatoly Spitkowski and uh, um, Chan Huntington in uh, uh, Rochester, and uh, the idea is that you have two plastic targets in, or beryllium targets. You shoot them with high. Uh, energy lasers, and uh, these ablates away some uh, plasma flows at the velocity of 2,000 kilometers per second. And the larval radius of these particles 
uh, is uh, significantly uh, so larger than the size of these. Uh, so sorry, the mean free path for Coulomb collision is significantly larger than the separation between the, 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 the two targets. And the Larmor radius, you can also play with some external fields and so on, is uh, uh, encompassed by the, the, the typical, by the region. So, so they have yet structures are. Yeah, yeah. And so these are, you can study the initial stages of formation of shock. So it's mostly viable instabilities and related stuff. I don't have time to go into details of these, but so the idea is that you can study astrophysical shocks from first principles with the usual uh, with approaches called particle in cell, in which you just uh, define your electromagnetic field on a grid. You place particles on this grid, say heavy uh, red protons and blue small and light electrons, move particles according to the Lorentz force, collect uh, uh, the fields, and so collect currents and charge distribution and evolve, evolve the fields according to Maxwell equations and uh, keep on iterating until you run out of time at your supercomputer because this is very expensive and uh, you can only simulate sort of microscopical uh, systems. A way of overcoming this uh, limitation is to use the so-called hybrid approach in which you consider electrons to be uh, a neutralizing fluid and still, you consider protons to be as kinetic particles. So this allows, so at, the, at this point, the typical time and length scales that need to be resolved are not the electron scales, but the ion scales. And yet, you retain most of the dynamics of the shock and clearly any kinetic process related to protons. So you can simulate more microscopical systems and having a, a full description of ion dynamics. A uh, typical example of uh, one of these simulations of a non-relativistic shocks uh, run with the, the hybrid code originally developed by uh, Luis Gerguetin collaborators that I tuned to, to the problem that we are interested in is uh, this. You send a supersonic flow against uh, a reflecting wall so that the interaction between the reflected flow and the incoming flow produces a shock that will propagate to the right in the figures. And here in the top panel, I, saw I show particle density and per trajectory of some particles. In the bottom panel, I show the out-of-plane magnetic field, which in the beginning is zero, because uh, the initial field is al aligned with the direction of propagation of the shock. This is what we usually refer to as uh, a parallel shock. So parallel means the direction of the magnetic field is parallel to the, no, to the shock normal, not the shock surface. I will use this uh, uh, also in the, in, in the following. So uh, this is how the, the simulation uh, proceeds. You see that part that you have the hot downstream plasma that moves towards upstream. And individ individual particles, yeah, whose tail is proportional to their energy, impinge on the shock. Some of them are, are reflected back. You can see these particles. And their energy, every time they encounter the shock, their energy becomes larger and larger. And eventually, particles start diffusing around the shock and are being. Tracer particles, that is the full representation. No, these are just uh, some few selected particles. And uh, you see that uh, where the field in that in the beginning was zero, uh, is not vanishing anymore because the current associated with these particles is producing uh, some electromagnetic waves even in the upstream of the shock. This is particularly important and we discuss it in details in a second. What about the spectrum of these particles? So let's start with what I claim to be the universal spectrum of cosmic ray of uh, ac particle accelerated via diffuse shock acceleration, which should be proportional to p two minus four in momentum. So if you convert these in in energy, you get that uh, uh, for uh, relativistic particles, p two minus four corresponds to e two minus two. Very simply, if you have no relativistic particles and these are purely purely non relativistic simulations for the moment. This would, be, would mean e to minus 1.5. So 
Here I plotted the phase space, so uh, energy uh, distribution versus position. This is the initially cold beam that gets uh, warm, that warms up when it encounters the shock, and this is the post-shock spectrum. And uh, in the beginning you have a Maxwellian, but when uh, the shock is developing, you see that uh, this Maxwellian develops a non-thermal tail that's uh, whose maximum extent increases with time because particles have more and more time to go back to the shock and get accelerated at, uh, at every time. And uh, at the same time, you see that uh, there are some energetic particles that are propagating upstream of the shock. And uh, eventually, the uh, Maxwellian accounts for 85% of the nominal energy that it should because 15% of the energy of the run pressure of the shock is channeled into this non-thermal tail, which I plotted as multiplied by e to 1.5, just to stress how this is the, it's exactly the prediction of first of order Fermi acceleration. So and how would this go up? Or are you just running out of particles, or is it reaching a steady state? Um, this only depends on the size of your simulation. And uh, when the diffusion length of these particles becomes comparable with the size of the box, uh, the maximum energy doesn't grow anymore. And uh, this is one of the reasons why this has been the first time uh, that Fermi acceleration has been seen in, in kinetic simulations. Simply one of the reasons is that we use the uh, or boxes a couple of orders of magnitude larger than, than before. And this allows for, for these tails to, to develop. Um, a larger scale uh, structure of the shock can be seen in this, uh, in this movie, which I show density, total magnetic field, and two components of the field. This is the parallel one, this is the uh, perpendicular, one, perpendicular one, the out of plane one. And uh, you see that uh, with these, uh, when the shock develops, there is this precursor uh, in which particles that are reflected back into the shock produce a current that drills holes in the upstream plasma. You can see this as you have a transverse fluctuation of B that couples with the current J, J cross B Lorentz force that pushes plasma out of these cavities. At the same time, particles are channeled, energetic particles are channeled into these cavities as uh, wires with the same uh, current that attract each other. And so this instability produces this pattern of holes and filaments, and also density perturbation that corrugate the shock surface. So when the shock runs into this inhomogeneous medium, you have turbulent motions and, uh, in which you have uh, a further amplification of the magnetic field. So here only the P is the iron plasma frequency? Uh, correct. Yep. And so, so to what extent can one think about these plume-like structures of the hydrodynamic uh, this is an electromagnetic phenomenon. Uh, I take it back. Because in principle, if you, so this filamentation is, uh, is due to the fact that you have this current. So uh, there are some modes that are MHD modes, like Bell modes are MHD. So if you, if you superimpose an external current on top of a shock, you will get the same pattern of uh, filamentation and uh, corrugation of the shock, and you will create uh, this elongated and structure of in enhanced magnetic Just field. Color, how many skin depths is the mean for your uh, So the Larmor radius of particles is of order of, for this simulation, is this is a Mach number, alphanic Mach number 30 simulation, so it's 30. So thermal particles are really tiny. The biggest, and the, even the transverse size accommodates the Larmor radius of the largest, of the most energetic particles in the system. And actually these structures, the spacing of these structures, corresponds to the Larmor radius of the highest energy particles in the simulation. This is as um, uh, possibly an observational counterpart that I'll show you in a second. And what is the 3D picture of the 3D view of this uh, instability? So if you take a slice upstream of the shock, like this one, uh, the color code on the box size uh, 
is density, so bright is downstream dense plasma, and uh, grayscale and uh, uh, arrows correspond to density and magnetic field in this slice. You see that when the shock moves towards this slide, you start seeing transverse fluctuation of the magnetic field. And uh, there is this pattern of uh, cavities that are under dense, so darker, and uh, uh, with less magnetic field surrounded by these filaments with a high density and strong magnetic fields. So this is a real uh, feature that's confirmed in 3D simulations. Uh, observationally speaking, in supernova remnants, uh, you have knots, uh, X-ray bright knots, that seem to uh, vanish on a year time scale or so, from which you infer the magnetic field must be of order of a milligauss, so like 10,000 uh, thousand times the, 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 the typical uh, interstellar field. And these may be produced uh, by these turbulent motions, these turbulent steerings in the downstream. But also there is one case, like Tycho supernova remnants, in which in the X-rays you see uh, a pattern of radial filaments. And uh, the pat these can be the, are sort of reminiscent of these elongated filaments that I showed before. Interestingly enough, the spacing of these stripes is the large radius of PEV particles, so of particles with energy comparable to the knee. And also from gamma ray emission from this object, we infer the presence of energetic ions, of ions as energetic as almost. Protons, protons. So, yeah, uh, electrons are cooled down by synchrotron emission. If you have higher energy, higher and so on. It's a rigidity dependent mechanism, so ion will be a factor of 26 more energetic than coal. And conservatively, I would say uh, half of a PEV for protons, and so then you can skate for higher energy particles. So um, I'm probably running a bit late, so I will. Okay, <laughs> okay no, I'll, I'll. Okay, just very briefly. So we can, all, of course, analyze the spectrum of the magnetic field that is generated in this way. So if you take the Fourier transform in different regions, this is the most interesting one. It's the region immediately upstream of the shock. So this purple, this magenta uh, spectrum, where this is sort of the energy density per logarithmic uh, uh, bandwidth. It's easier to see to define this way. You see that uh, this is a uh, power law proportional to k to the minus 1 between two uh, values of k that correspond to the values uh, resonant with particles with typical shock velocity and the maximum energy. Where resonant means that uh, the wavelength of these modes is comparable with the Larmor radius of particles with this energy. And uh, this is exactly what you would expect uh, by the turbulence uh, that is generated by a population of particles with a spectrum of p to minus 4. And uh, the reason you can, in, if, you take, if you think about uh, relativistic particles, p to minus 4 is e to minus 2. That means that the same energy per decade. And uh, a spectrum k to minus 1 uh, would, o would also be f uh, flat in energy spectrum. So to some extent, for some parameter uh, ranges, you have a one-to-one -one mapping of uh, the energy in uh, particles with a given momentum into waves with a wave number at the, the resonant moment. There are some other regimes in which this is not true, but I, I, we can discuss this later if someone is interested. Um, I, now I would like to spend um, some moments uh, in uh, discussing what changes between parallel and uh, oblique shocks. So when you have, uh, when you change, when you tilt the direction of the upstream magnetic field with respect to the shock velocity, you see that uh, for very oblique shocks, uh, there is a bump uh, on top of the Maxwellian that is due to shock drift acceleration, which is simply particles.
are gyrating around the magnetic field, and they probe the velocity gradient around the shock, but just a couple of times before they are detected in the downstream. So they only gain a factor of a few in energy, and this tail doesn't, in, doesn't grow with time. In this case, uh, you don't have uh, particles, so these particles don't propagate into the upstream. So you don't have self generation of magnetic field. So if you start with an oblique shock, you remain with an oblique shock. On the other hand, if you start from a, par from a quasi parallel shock, you have these, uh, these leaking of particles into the upstream, they drive instabilities, and you converge to a sort of. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. You you can. I, I show you in 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 a few slides how the number of particles that can make it uh, that can overrun the shock strongly depends on the inclination of the magnetic field. So, for instance, for 60 degrees, uh, you only 10 to the minus five of the particles can make it into the upstream, and this current is not uh, enough for driving bell modes on an advection time scale. So. Uh, for quasi-parallel shocks, you have diffusive shock acceleration. The natural question is, what is the efficiency of this acceleration? So as a function of the inclination and for different Mach numbers, uh, the acceleration is typically between 5 and 15%, but it abruptly drops about 45 degrees because of this lack of particles. So the mechanism is not self-sustaining for very oblique shocks. and. Uh, a magnetic field amplification follow the, uh, uh, the same pattern. So if you look at the total magnetic field map as a function of the inclination of the shock, you see that all of this turbulence is there for parallel and quasi-parallel shocks. But quasi-oblique and perpendicular shocks are almost laminar. There is no perturbation in the upstream and uh, not even in the downstream. You can see that the profile of uh, magnetic field as a function in, in front of the shock and calculate which is the amplification factor in front of the shock. And what, what one finds is that the, the total amplification produced by these instabilities that operate in the upstream of the shock scales with the sonic, sorry, with the alphanic Mach number. That means that the smaller the magnetic field, the larger the alphanic Mach number, the larger is the amplification. So in other words, it, gets, it takes less particle to steer up a low magnetic field. And uh, the total amplification that you get goes like the square root it's of the. That's a, that's a bit reminiscent of the MRI. MRI, I think, I'm sure in Boston, get into that now. But, yeah. yeah, so you don't, over, you don't compensate exactly for the low, for the right. reduced the magnetic field that you have. But it goes so, yes, right. in that direction. Yeah. And and it saturates at this level for a very fundamental reason, at least for this instability. That we I'm happy to, to chat about this later. And again, this is confirmed in 3D simulations, uh, where you can see that the self-generated magnetic field is prominent upstream for parallel and also for 45 degree inclination shocks, and there is no self-generated field upstream of uh, uh, oblique shocks. And spectrum is also the same. You don't have diffusive shock acceleration at perpendicular shocks, in, even in 3D. Uh, observational counterpart of this is supernova remnant 1006. So this is an X-ray map where the red is thermal uh, uh, emission and white uh, is non thermal, like synchrotron emission. That it's only concentrated in these two years, in these two lobes. So, recent uh, 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 polarization analysis, so they inferred uh, by Gray Nose and collaborators, they found that the local inclination of the magnetic field with respect to the shock normal is such that in these polar cap regions, the shock is quasi parallel. And it's quasi perpendicular in these two regions. This line is also the direction of the magnetic field in the galactic plane 
uh, and it's also the direction of the magnetic field that you would infer, the local magnetic field, that you would infer from starlight polarization in the direction of 10 of So there is strong argument for these to be the regions where the shock is parallel to the large scale magnetic field. And interestingly. So, so what's the relevant power in a higher That's an excellent question. Uh, so in our galaxy, uh, we know that the coherence length is probably of order of 80, 100 parsec. And uh, then you may, you may argue that there is a Kolmogorov spectrum down to uh, dissipation scales or whatever. Uh, the problem is that, I mean the problem, uh, this may be different in the disk or above the disk. So this object is quite peculiar because it lies quite high above the disk. So it shows this uh, possibility that it shows this bilateral structure because above the disk, the coherence length of the magnetic field is larger than the 20 parsec radius of this object. If you look at supernova remnants in the disk, uh, they typically have a more spherical uh, structure, maybe because the, the coherence length in the disk is smaller than the size of the remnant. But there is an interesting object, which is G1.9 plus O3. That's the youngest remnant in our galaxy. It has, is 100 years old, 120 years old. And uh, it shows a bilateral structure, possibly because uh, it's young, so it's small, and it's still probing one coherence length of the magnetic field, even if it is in the disk. The, the interesting, please. Correct. My recollection was from this object, people were, trying, were claiming that the efficiency in the right spots was up to like 50%. Yeah, that was, uh, so if you trace the position of the forward shock with the H alpha emission and the position of the contact discontinuity with uh, uh, the transition between non-thermal to thermal X-rays, uh, you see in, in some points uh, they are too close uh, to be consistent with the standard hydrodynamical uh, calculations. So people argue that, well, maybe if there is cosmic rays, the they act as a relativistic fluid. So the compression ratio, rather than being three, it's seven. And this helps bringing forward shock and contact discontinuity closer together. The problem is that probably in this argument, uh, instabilities are very important. Actually, there are regions in which the forward shock and the contact discontinuity estimated with this um, process almost overlap. And this would even acceleration efficiency of 100% wouldn't be enough to explain this. Uh, so uh, there are other ways of estimating local acceleration efficiency that are related to the uh, uh, downstream proton temperature as estimated by Balmer line emission. And uh, there are regions in which you see the downstream emission that that's the broad line that's narrower than you would expect for this shock velocity. And you can interpret the difference of the energy as energy that went into cosmic rays. Uh, there is a, it's a very powerful diagnostic, but with, when you use that, you don't expect acceleration efficiency as, as high as 50%. It's more in the 10% range. Very interestingly, the polarization is very small. It's, it's less than 20% in these polar caps. It means that here the field is turbulent, and it's 70% in these two regions. So natural interpretation is that where the shock is quasi parallel, you get a lot of magnetic field amplification driven by ions, and uh, this produces turbulent fields. When the shock is perpendicular, you just have compression of the upstream field, and you have a high level of polarization. And uh, now I would like to point, yeah, so, well, I've already said this. Uh, so now I would like to devote five minutes to uh, what determines the fate of particles, why some particles are promoted to cosmic rays and why it is just 1% and not more than that. So by looking at the spectrum in the, behind, the, be behind the shock, uh, we see that uh, immediately behind the shock, there is a, a sort of bridge 
be a steep bridge between the thermal peak, which is not fully developed yet, and the non-thermal tail. And this suprathermal region goes away, and when you go far downstream, you have a pretty sharp discontinuity between thermal and non-thermal. And this bridge uh, contains information about particles that get injected and those particles that get thermalized. And uh, roughly as a rule of thumb, you can see that acceleration, that the boundary between thermal and non-thermal is around uh, three to four times uh, the downstream thermal energy, thermal momentum. Why? It will, become, it will become clear in a second. So here, uh, uh, this is a paper that, uh, that we has just recently uh, been accepted on a J letter. And so the, the second name is an undergrad student. This was her junior paper uh, research and uh, in which we tracked some shells of particles that are impinging on the shock and uh, label particles according to their final energy. So uh, green particles will be particles that are, whose final energy is less than twice the initial one, this is the kinetic energy they have in the beginning. Suprathermal particles will be between 2 and 10, the non-thermal particles above 10, where the DSA, the diffusion shock acceleration tail, begins. This is the number of fraction, this is a fraction of particles that end up becoming non-thermal as a function of time. So when you see this part, this is the phase space px momentum as a function of x. So you, first of all, you see that the shock is not a static structure. The shock reforms on a cyclotron time scale because particles impinge on the shock barrier when the shock barrier is high. So there is a pressure, electron pressure gradient that corresponds to an electric field in this direction. So when ions arrive and see these high electric fields, they are reflected. But they are reflected in a coherent way. And this produces this uh, beam that interacts with the incoming one and the, the shock reforms one large more radius ahead. So particles that are impinge on the shock when the barrier is high are reflected back. Bar particles that impinge when the shock, when the barrier is low, are advected in the downstream and just become thermal particles. This is a particularly lucky shell of particles. See, most of them are accelerated. They, they are reflected back. They undergo another cycle of shock drift acceleration because they are surfing the shock surface, where shock now is a broad uh, transition between upstream and downstream. But this is the nature of uh, quasi-parallel shocks. They are reforming on a cyclotron time scale. And so you can put together a model for particle injection that goes like this. So first of all, you, we notice that this reflection uh, happens uh, on a reforming barrier. So if you plot the density profile as a function of time, the shock barrier stalls and then it, mo it jumps ahead as a function of time. So it's stationary in the downstream frame. And so you can calculate uh, ion trajectories by going in the, the Hoffman-Teller frame and, uh, calculate and ask a natural question. So what is the uh, fate of a particle that impinges on the shock with a given velocity. So if you split the velocity as the velocity along the shock normal and perpendicular to the shock normal, for every inclination of the upstream field, there is a minimum velocity that you need in order to be reflected back and not to be advected in the downstream. It turns out that this critical, or you, you can even reflect this and say for there is a critical angle, so at, at any given velocity, there is a critical angle such that if the inclination is less than these particles escape, or if the inclination is higher than these particles are back in the downstream. So here, this is the plot, and I would focus on this 45 degree uh, contour, because if you, we know that if we have efficient particle acceleration, there is magnetic field amplification. That means that the B parallel over B perp is of order one. So there is a universal inclination of efficient shocks that's 45 degrees. And for 45 degrees, the energy that you need to be injected 
is exactly a few times the initial one. So the initial, the injection energy must be five to 10 times the shock, the initial one. Notice that if the inclination is larger, you need a larger energy to be, to, to be injected. That means that if only you need more and more cycles of shock drift acceleration to get there. So only fewer and fewer particles can make it. This is the way, this is the reason why particles are, the fraction of reflected particles, injected particles is suppressed at, at oblique shocks. Can we go back to this just because I have Sure. Uh, What is the, the Hoffman teller? Assume that teller of teller. Yeah, it's, the, it's that teller. <laughs> so, uh, so this is, the, uh, this is a, a reference frame that moves with the shock. At, uh, so, and it's also, the, you, so you make a boost along the direction of propagation of the shock in order to, to sit on the shock. But you also make a, a boost in the transverse direction in order to readjust to some extent the flow velocity to making along the direction of the magnetic field. In this, this is a particular uh, frame because in this frame there is no electric field. There is no induction field because B is parallel to V and uh, uh, everything, the re everything is stationary so there is no f electric fields associated to uh, time variation. So it, it's, it's a frame in which it's easy to follow particle trajectories because it's just magnetic uh, helixes. So um, I'm used to thinking of uh, shock mediation winds, et cetera. And here it seems to be um, really quite complicated. It's not, I mean, I guess it's a Px effect, but um, the fact that those flows that sort of do this uh, relatively large distance uh, yep. redevelopment is a pretty remarkable description, which uh, is so nonlinear and disconnected that I guess there's no way you can really handle it without a uh, full out simulation. No? And actually, this is next slide, in which <laughs> at least uh, we tried to do some, uh, to extract a minimal model that it's able to reproduce this, ver this, ver this particle injection. So if you make a, a potential barrier that's time varying, the sense that you go into the hoffman teller frame, and you make a potential barrier that it goes up and down, that a gyro period, and it's in the high state for 25% of the time, such that in this 25% of this duty cycle, you have particle reflection and shock lift acceleration, and in the, the the rest of the time, you just have a low barrier particles just go into downstream and get thermalized. You can follow, uh, you have a synthetic shock. You throw particles at this synthetic shock, and you follow their displacement with respect to the shock position. So uh, most of the particles just go into downstream, and they're advected. Some particles that are lucky to impinge on the barrier when the barrier is high are reflected back. And then they have another probability of being advected in the downstream or to go back in, 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 in the upstream to bounce again. So for every shock velocity, for, having, for any inclination of the magnetic field, you can construct it, such a synthetic shock and calculate the, the fraction of particles that end up being uh, suprathermal, non-thermal, or thermal. And uh, so these multiple cycles of shock drift acceleration is essential to accelerate particles up to the level in which they can fly away in the, up in the upstream. No particles can escape the shock at the first uh, uh, 45 degree shock just by a single reflection. You need at least two. 25% is calibrated here. It's the number that's calibrated here. Correct. Yeah, yeah. But it's related to the, to the fourth of the gyration that particles are doing. There is, sorry? There's a heuristic there. Yeah, yeah. And the nice thing is that uh, you can also, uh, so the number of injected particles, it's about 1% for 45 degrees. Quite interestingly, you can uh, also construct a synthetic spectrum for these particles. So 
Bell in 78 uh, argued that the, the spectrum is just determined by the slope. It's determined by the, probability, the ratio of the probability of leaving the accelerator and the, the energy gain per cycle. And in this process, we, we are ex explicitly giving the probability of being advecting in the downstream. And uh, we know what is the energy gain per cycle. And so if you build, uh, if you fold this information in, the, the prediction of this minimal model follows the results of a simulation, I would say, in a remarkable way. I, I was amazed to see how good the agreement is. And it fully reproduces the transition between thermal, suprathermal, and non-thermal particles. And uh, eventually, uh, you can see these different populations of particles map into uh, but, but each other. The size dependent. The, all time dependent if the box is large enough. And uh, this determines of, uh, uh, true, so the cutoff, so the acceleration rate is determined by the diffusion rate. And this is something also that can be estimated. It turns out to be, I don't have time to go into this, but it turns out to do that bomb diffusion, it's a good description for this. So the mean free path is as small as the larval radius of the particles. But the mean free path in the amplified magnetic field, which is a non-trivial result. And uh, uh, so wrapping up, these are sort of the conclusions in which acceleration shocks can be efficient. Quasi-parallel shocks, you get 50, easily 15% of the acceleration into 15% uh, uh, of the kinetic energy. So, so can I stop you with that? How universal is that? I was expecting this question. So you can, from, from this, you can, from simulations, you can say this is a lower limit. But on the other hand, there is a feedback that uh, suppresses in particle injection when acceleration becomes important. Because if you channel a large fraction of the kinetic energy into accelerated particles, you are making the shock weaker. If you make the shock weaker, the compression ratio goes down. And the energy gain per cycle of shock drift acceleration is less. That means that in order to be injected, you need more cycles of shock drift acceleration. And this limits the number of particles that is injected. So it's a self-regulating mechanism. And in fact, we see this value to saturate at 10, 15%. If you run it for longer, the maximum energy moves, and the total normalization goes down to accommodate for the energy for this 10, 15% acceleration. And sorry, it does seem to be changing. It changes. It changes a bit, exactly for the same reason. If the shock is weak, the energy gain per cycle per, uh, is less, and you inject less particles. And uh, I don't know if I have uh, uh, sure. five minutes, or you, you, you tell me. I you got lots of questions. Okay, uh, the idea is that what do we do next? So what do we do from here? So a uh, challenge would be to go towards bigger and faster shocks and so run more realistic simulations. And this is something that we are going to do with this super hybrid approach. And also, we are interested in the electron physics and with full particle and cell simulations. We have a paper out and there are several in the. I, in, in a second. <laughs> so, and uh, eventually, you might also be interested in embedding the microphysics of particle acceleration into larger scale hydro and MHD simulations. And for this, uh, we are, uh, are developing a craft, so a cosmic ray analytical fast tool that uh, should do the work. And I, I, if I have time, so of course you can extend these to relativistic shocks, and there are also a lot of questions and a lot of problems that you can investigate with these kind of simulations. But uh, if I have two, I would like to devote two minutes to these three points just to see where we are going. So this is a, a snapshot of a Mach number 100 simulations with hybrid, uh, full hybrid. 
So the instabilities are so strong that the, the shock surface is completely disrupted. So it's, uh, it's, even, it's even harder to tell where the shock is. This is close to total amplification is a factor of 10 in the, in the upstream. And uh, this is close as what we can do right now with hybrid approaches. Uh, takes a million CPU hours to, to run it. Also, Sorry? And efficiency is still going up? Efficiency, yeah, it's still, yeah, it's, uh, it's 15%. Not much more than that. Uh, but you know, it's even harder to tell where the shock is <laughs> at this point. So uh, a possibility to go to a larger and faster shocks is to remember that there is this uh, difference between thermal particles, super thermal particles, and non-thermal particles. So if we can model this thermal component with an MHD code, we know what thermal particles do and uh, describe non-thermal particles as real kinetic ions, and maybe we allow them to become relativistic, we can have, exactly, so this is what I was saying, we save a lot of computational time. Of course, you need to understand what the interface between these two regimes is, but I hope I convinced you that with full hybrid simulations, we can get good handle of how particle injection works. And so, uh, we can, devote all of the computational power in pushing a tiny fraction of particles on a grid whose, Larmor, whose, mean, whose uh, cell must resolve the Larmor radius of the of the lowest energy uh, non-thermal particles rather than the ion skin depth. So preliminary study of this, long, we can study a long-term evolution of, of shocks. Uh, and you see that this uh, is simulation much bigger box uh, and uh, with a fraction of the computational cost, uh, the structures are always there and uh, they grow to larger and larger scales. And eventually you also see effects like the back reaction of particles. The shock slows down, we expect to expect the position because of the energy that went into accelerated particles and so on. So this is just one thing that we can do. Uh, yeah, yeah. And actually, we can also study the transition in the from the non-relativistic to the relativistic regime because particles can become relativistic, and the spectrum is p to minus four across the regime. Uh, so another thing that you can do is to study electron ion acceleration with full particle in cell simulations. So this is a, a recent simulation for a Mach number 20 shock, 0.1 C. The closer to, to, to C, the, the easier it is to simulate for quasi-parallel shocks, like 30 degree shocks. Shock. So uh, this is, the again, the XPX space density, post-shock spectrum of ions and electrons, momentum and energy. This is the profile of the magnetic field. The important thing is that you, you see that both electrons and ions develop the non-thermal tail. And for both, this is multiplied by p to the four, so for both, you see diffusive shock acceleration. The, this is the first simulation that shows simultaneous acceleration of electrons and ions. And uh, this is interesting because electrons were known to be energized or pre-energized are quasi-perpendicular shocks or very oblique shocks. But I showed you before that ions prefer quasi-parallel shocks. But the nice thing is that since when ions are accelerated at quasi-parallel shocks, they develop this transverse perturbation that make the effective inclination 45 degrees. And the electrons like 45 degrees shocks. And so they get accelerated as well, but with a different normalization. So we can calculate the electron to proton ratio, which turns out to be a, a few percent that's consistent with the multi-wavelength observation of supernova remnants, and also with the ratio of electrons and protons that we see in cosmic rays. You need to do some extrapolation to, relativistic, to, to realistic mass ratios and to no relativistic shocks, but at least it's in the right ballpark. Uh, this is the, the, the ratio of the normalization of the tails. Uh, 
another interesting thing that we can study is what happens if you have a 60 degree shock where we know that I hope I convinced you that you don't have proton acceleration, yet you see electron acceleration. And the reason is that electrons are being lighter, are faster than shocks, so they can overrun the shock. And uh, uh, there are, there, so there is a regime of uh, uh, inclinations for which you only have electron acceleration at the 10% level. And you have a magnetic field amplification due to electron-driven instabilities. This is something uh, new, as far as I know. And it's quite important because there are a lot of transrelativistic shocks in which uh, the energy in the electrons is inferred to be like a few percent, 10 percent of the uh, run kinetic energy. And there is also one case. So, um, what about plasmoids? Sorry, what pl plasmoids? So particles are scattered on uh, on on this self-generated magnetic field. Uh, so delta B over B is of order of a few in this case. So you are effectively electrons can effectively reorient the the the, the normal of the shock the inclination of the shock with respect to the magnetic field. This is quite important for uh, radio radics in galaxy clusters, from which you see a lot of radio emission from uh, uh, electrons. But So electrons must be accelerated at 10% level. But you cannot accommodate for the typical electron to proton ratio that you see in supernova remnants, because otherwise you, you would violate the uh, upper limits in the gamma rays by Fermi. So Fermi is uh, observing, would observe the gamma ray from decay of neutral pions produced by interaction of uh, cosmic ray protons with uh, the surrounding medium. And uh, this is a possible way out. And it's consistent with the polarization, right? Correct. And it's consistent with the fact that if you start with a, now the question becomes, how do you get a quasi-perpendicular shock over two megaparsec scale, this is a problem for people who do <laughs> cosmological simulation and so on. Or another possibility is that you see the, the regions that shine are those where the local magnetic field is perpendicular. It's in where the quasi parallel regions may be under dominant. But this is still work in progress. Uh, last two slides. So how do you uh, port uh, this uh, cosmic ray acceleration in your code. So uh, one possibility is to write down the transport equation for cosmic rays in, uh, in such a way. So it's the fusion convection equation because in the stationary version you, uh, you have uh, uh, advection, diffusion, adiabatic uh, changes of, of momentum, and inject some particles. Uh, well, particles are injected with a given energy at the position, like the shock position. And uh, these equations uh, at shocks uh, can be solved uh, in a self-consistent way. You don't have to bother about uh, the actual solutions. But the idea is that you can write an implicit solution of this equation. So you have a description of the, of the distribution function as a function of position and momentum of the particles. You take the moment of this distribution, and you have the pressure in cosmic rays. You plug this pressure in cosmic rays into an equation for generation of magnetic fields. And the pressure in, in magnetic fields and, in, and uh, in particles can be plugged into conservation of mass and momentum, from which you derive the new velocity profile. And you iterate this until you've, you converge. This uh, semi-analytical solution is very fast. It takes a few seconds on a laptop. While if you wanted to solve this equation, this set of equations, uh, uh, numerically, it would take days. Or Monte Carlo solution of this would take, again, days or weeks on clusters. But it, it's flexible. 
because it embeds all the macrophysics that comes from, sim from simulations where you can estimate like the diffusion coefficient, injection parameters, and so on. And you can port these as a subgrid model for large scale simulations. One example of this is a study that we did of Tycho supernova remnant, which is observed over more than 20 orders of magnitude, and uh, from, from radio to X rays to gamma rays from both Fermi and Veritas. This is a particularly important remnant because the uh, gamma ray spectrum can only be fitted with uh, an hadronic model. So the pi zero, so the gamma ray emission comes from the decay of neutral pions. And, if, uh, and you cannot fit this emission with uh, inverse Compton emission from the same relativistic electrons that are producing the synchrotron emission because it would have the wrong shape or the wrong normalization depending on what photon background you are using. So you can simultaneously, you can plug this uh, semi-analytical approach into a, a semi-analytical evolution of the supernova remnant and you can study the, uh, also the spatially resolved radio and X-ray profile of the, of the remnant and uh, the acceleration that you require to fit the gamma ray emission is around 10% and the cutoff must be about for 500 TeV. That's barely consistent with the, the knee in the cosmic ray spectrum. Maybe later, I mean, in early times, Tycho was acting with exapavotron, but we don't really, at the moment it seems unlikely. Uh, important thing to stress here is that when we did this, uh, work in 2012, uh, we, were, we were assuming bone diffusion and we had two free parameters, one the injection efficiency and the electron to proton ratio. Now we can constrain these values from kinetic simulation. So to some extent, uh, this result uh, has no free parameter. So we can fit the uh, multi-wavelength emission over 20 orders of magnitude almost without any assumption. And I leave you with a dramatic formation of the dramatic movie of shock formation. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, I would say it's restricted to 1D, but one, yeah, yeah, because uh, on the other hand, a natural question is what 2D effects may be important. Maybe 1D spherical is important because at that point you would have a diabetic losses and dilution and so on. That can be handled uh, quite easily, but in terms of subgrid model, I think that uh, 1D should be uh, should be fine for most of the purposes. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's go upstairs and have some cookies. If there are cookies, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, if there are cookies, and, and uh, let's thank Daniela.